Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage your moderator, Summer Flynn from the Dolls of Horror podcast. And now we have Billy and Lisa Zane. Shut up. I said, 
really? And I, I had not received the DVD yet, so I hadn't watched it yet. And he goes, yeah, I'm in drag. And I'm like, and his name's also Billy, by the way, which is bizarre. Um, and I was like, wow, that's so interesting, because I had no idea when I ordered this, this DVD that I was going to have my friend in it. Did he play the character in the large bar who was laughing hysterically? That's my man. That's my man, Billy Morley. This crazy shot, this mad It's a great shot. You have to get context. This film was Ed Wood's final opus as a script that was as yet unfilmed. And uh, his wife had it, a director I had met, had convinced her to relinquish it. It was saved from a fire from his house. It was the only object he took. It was the only print of it. It wasn't electri uh, electronically saved. It just had this weird, bizarre dream. Long story longer, the film was a silent <laughs> film. Yes. There was no dialogue in it. However, leave it to Ed Wood to make it about a character with a sonic disability. <laughs> totally insane and completely bizarre. It's a crime spree morality tale about this deranged thief who wears drag of a nurse to steal oh, to, to sneak out of a, a, a of a, of a uh, insane <laughs> asylum. I love that. It's not his pension. It was just <laughs> it was just you know it's how he could get out. Um, and uh, and it's filled with yeah, really and it's uh, filled with like thirty incredible cameos. I mean the cast off the top of your head: Sandra Bernhardt, Christina Ricci, John Ritter, John Ritter, uh, Caleb Thomas. Taylor <laughs> Thomas, uh, uh, Rick Schroeder, Andrew McCarthy, uh, Ron Perlman, Stephen Weber. Who? Stephen Weber. Stephen Weber. Stephen Weber. Stephen Weber. <laughs> Will Patton. Yeah. You know, I mean, it just goes because on and on. on. Uh, Tippi Hedren's in this movie. Yes, Tippi um, Hedren. Eartha Kitt. Eartha Kitt. Yeah. She is the only person who speaks because she sings yeah. on the film, performs a number. And it's on our movie. That's my two larger pointers. Sonic disability, did I mention the song? Well, she's not just still having trouble because we blasted her with the speaker when we came in. That's <laughs> minute. Uh, anyway, funny movie. It was the first. It was the first movie to be leaked to the internet in like 2000. Oh my god. Uh, oh. It, it it had a very weird and sordid release. Like went out for a week and then. Distributor died. It was just bizarre, it went, it, and you could only find it in Germany on a bootleg DVD. It's just, it's been consistently Ed Wood, <laughs> yeah. right to the point where you gotta find it. I had a real tough time finding it on DVD. Yeah. It's the only copy I found on eBay I'm selling for seventy dollars, and I'm broke. So, but I found a but seller. Worth it. It's an Easter egg. Yeah, know. I found a seller, and it does not look like a bootleg, so I'm thinking it's an actual copy. No, it's a beautiful. Thing. Yeah, it was great, and like I said, it was so interesting, but because you talked about, and he talked about your, your song in it. Oh, he said the song. Right? right? Yes? So, anyways, I just had to tell that, that really funny story, because I had no idea that my dear friend was in that movie, and I was like, well, I know, but great. bought it a long time ago. Oh, he's, the, the, he's the last close-up of a giant, crazy fight scene, that, right. and that comes on the heels of Eartha Kitt's big song. Number. Yeah, it's fantastic. And then, so you know, it's uh, some original too. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, do we have any audience questions? Sorry. Yes. Sir. All right. So talking about Tales from the Crypt, uh, being in Demon Knight, going from a TV show to a movie, how did it feel to be part of that like giant entity at the time? But how did it feel to go from a TV show to a motion picture that was? co-starting. Thank you. I um, I actually had the pleasure of doing an episode of the series. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you yeah. saw that with uh, Martin Sheen. Well-cooked hams. Yep. Well-cooked hams. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that was the that one with the cannibalistic... Uh... No. No? It was about a magician. We were magicians. Rival magicians. I think you're thinking of the Christopher Reeve one. Right. Right. And... Uh, okay, Thank you for confusing me with Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're still here with us right now. Well, all the time. Well, the time. <laughs> um, well doing the film was uh, uh, one of my favorite experiences. Um, the, um, Mr. Dickerson, our director, who was, you know, 
visionary and really fun, was very welcoming and inviting uh, of uh, suggestion. And there was a lot of improvisations, an incredible cast uh, of actors uh, in a very contained uh, narrative. And uh, they let me, you know, I tested the waters and started trying, you know, some comedy in a character that wasn't necessarily written as funny. Um, and they, you know, kept letting me go and I kept pushing to see where the boundary was, where the limit would come in and they never stopped me. So I was like, can I keep, can I do this? And I go, really? Is anyone waiting for the hook? Never came. And I went, okay, this is, gonna, okay, here we go. And they were just very generous. Um, and the, the catch, release, and balance of great in-camera gore and wonderful, you know, effects by Todd Masters and his gang doing great creature effects, everything pretty much in camera was, uh, you know, which was at times shocking and genuinely scary and kind of fun, uh, was balanced by a um, false sense of security and some good laughs. <laughs> and so just when you're lulled into or you find something charming, bam, you know, someone's head gets punched through and a <laughs> crazy thing happens like that didn't just happen. So I highly recommend it. It's kind of like a starter drug for horror if you're know, introducing people to the genre. By the way, I'm going to lie. Right? What's that? I said, when you said, by the way, I'm lying. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. There was that. It's, uh, yes, I love that movie. Do you have a favorite scene to shoot from Demon Knight? A what? Do you have a favorite scene that you shot, like while you're shooting? Um, I like the scene with the, uh, I mean, the, the, there's, people seem to like this kind of funny little uh, number I do after I, I, I come in and you think, they set me up as the hero in a way, like a Western hero with a hat and a duster and I come in and you think I'm, look, I'm almost like a bounty hunter and then it's revealed that I'm in fact the villain in this movie and I dive through this window it's clear I got some weird powers, and I lose this hat and jacket because we had to lose the hat and jacket. Which the question was, how do we get rid of this outfit in an organic way? It just kind of came out in a funky little dance and a song <laughs> <laughs> that seemed to resonate. Um, you got to see it to understand what I'm saying. Uh, that was kind of fun, and the scene with Thomas Hayden Church on the stairwell um, was really fun. Uh, when there's this blood seal that we have to, you know, either remove, you know, it's one of the, it's a barrier I can't cross. I produced this sponge out of my mouth, which was kind of funny. Which just, again, happened as a result of <laughs> asking, you know, hey, you got a sponge? Can you wash it? <laughs> it was good. Um, yeah, fun scene. He said, do you have a favorite scene uh, from Freddy Fett? Yeah, I really liked when I was flinging the knives at him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the physicality of wrestling with him, because he's such a good physical actor, you know, so that was fantastic. It was, it was like the Olympics of physical acting, you know, that guy. And it was fun to, you know, fling his knives. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah, the whole, the whole, like, I really like that final act. The yeah. final act, yeah. But yeah, it was, that was yeah. really fun. Yeah. I like my outfit too, it was kind of sporty. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I think so. Um, any other questions? Why was there any more um, sequels to Phantom? I mean, like, you had the whole one story of the Skulls of Tuganda, but there was, I mean, you could have done so many sequels. Why wasn't there more any projects on that? Um, that's a very good question. You know, it came out a little ahead of its time and right at a window that over time I think was more uh, like appreciated in terms of its uh, white hat heroism, you know, and a character who was pretty well adjusted, you know, pretty happy hero, dug his gig, you know, <laughs> uh, which was great. But at that particular time, we were beginning this love affair with the anti hero in cinema. Everything was a little dark and edgy, and it's, you know, that's cool. And it, we, it, I, they went down that path. Um, and now I feel it's logical to do, because we're, you know, 20 years later, or whatever it is, almost more. And 
and uh, it's a father-son franchise. I mean, like that's kind of their their business, you know, you know do gooding, and uh, and it's it's logical that that mantle would be passed. So I'd love to do another one. I think it's timely to introduce, you know, where Kit right, would be the you know now the father figure trying to train or hand off to Kit. Well, we've been speaking about it, and it's something that. It really needs to happen because that is your torch and legacy. Thank you. I'm, I'm a big fan of it, and I think you know people love the character. And I think it's uh, it's come around at a time where I think we need uh, the kind of example of moral compass. And uh, you know, did you actually it. see the sci-fi film in the original one? I'm sorry. Did you actually see the sci-fi film? They made a sci-fi film about it like years ago. Yeah, and no. they actually made the actual A. <laughs> 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 it's okay, yours is better. I, <laughs> I would have. It just kind of turned. I saw. It, I, I, I was about to rent it one night. Uh, remember video stores? Yeah. <laughs> Gotta love physical media. I still. Do. Come on. Right. Yeah. I saw yeah. that one uh, called Rocket Video. And they just they, they, the response wasn't that great. But I, you know, I support the franchise. And, you know, I love the I love the publishers. You know, and love the character. It would be it would be a, a blast to do. But uh, we're talking to folks at Paramount about it, and, and uh, I think we ought to talk to Ken Rowe. We'll get everyone in concert. I assume. I'll tell you what. Write them and ask for it. <laughs> the thing that's going to make it happen is if the fans. And who you know genuinely love this this story really galvanize it. There's so much story though that's into this Phantom one that you can just pass the torch on, like a training section to another you know jewel piece like the skull <laughs> or even your skull ring. They can pass the torch to that. I'm sure they're hiring at Paramount. <laughs> I'm, I'm more of a security guard. Thank think you. Your ideas are extraordinary. <laughs> Bring them in. Write them in. Love it. I saw right. a hand come up. Wait a minute. Okay, Orton? Yeah. Yeah. You were talking about in Deep and Night, they will let you do some comedy. The ho dump, ho dump, well, them there, motherfuckers line. That would be it. <laughs> that would be the line at the end of the day. Did you talk about that? I was talking, were you, in, were you in here when we were talking about that scene? Or did you just fly in? I, I, I missed it. You missed it. We were just talking about that in our scene. Someone, that, someone said, what's your favorite scene? I'm going to let you describe it to him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was improvised. <laughs> that was one of, yeah, we were just saying, that they had, we had to figure out how to get rid of the hat and the coat. And I said, I got it, I got it. <laughs> That's what came out. Devil. Definitely. Do with the horns. Uh, one of my favorite films that you were in was Orlando with Tilda Swift. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Talk about Certainly. that experience. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was one of, I guess, Tilda's early films, maybe the first or second, I think. She was um, amazing. Um, Sally Potter, the writer director, was based on a Virginia Woolf novel. Um, it was. Uh, Beautifully art directed by the same Dutch team who did Peter Greenaway's films, who were known for their maximalism at cost, and it was it was really uh, extraordinary for what they pulled off for the budget at that time. Um, and I was so thrilled to be part of it because it was it you know it's it's a allegory and a weird little journey of this time traveling sex changing really a uh, character who by waking up every you know few hundred years she turn you know she she pit, wakes up in a period as a woman when the rights for a woman are absolutely you know impossible and wakes up as a man when the you know what it means to be a man is to die for your country and go to you know go to war it's like it's like the shit end of the stick every time <laughs> you, look, you know she look really and it's kind of an interesting Journey through um, uh, through our ages, uh, shining a light on gender politics, and, and then of course you show up. And I turn up. Romancer and give her a baby. I, you know, 
Each turns up as an adventure. Each ca each sequence is categorized by you know love, death, sex, and I turned up in the sex <laughs> sequence, which I thought was very uh, convenient. Uh, turned out to be useful. And turned out to be useful. Right? It's a beautiful movie. I highly recommend you see it. Thank you. Do you have one? Angel. Yes, yeah, you. Yes, ma'am. Me. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, as my favorite uh, cameo in Zoolander, I just wondered, <laughs> can we have a walk-off? <laughs> <laughs> it's a walk-off. It's a walk-off. <laughs> oh, okay. Both of them. Have you seen Zoolander too? Yes. Uh -huh. it's, yes. I think it's, it's a real generous film. <laughs> it's, it is. It's really funny. It's like, it's lush and hysterical. It says, it says twisted and fun is the first, but, you know, it really lands. Love. It's funny, you get, you know, more love for playing yourself for five minutes than 30 years of character work. <laughs> Should have stood, done that earlier. Sir. <laughs> yes. What do you got? Okay. Uh, speaking of Zoolander, you've been in a movie with uh, David Bowie. You've been in a movie with uh, Alice Cooper. Is there any time where you've been starstruck on set? Oh, always. So, so many times. Um, yeah, and it's often for the rock stars, and you know, so, you know it's kind of fun. Love Bowie stars. But when you're, you know, David Bowie. Zoolander, he, he <laughs> judged the walk-off. He, well, no, it was, we were on different days, so we shared a edit. It's Eva. I met him at a party. He was deciding whether to marry Iman or not. He was asking everyone. It was my party. We met him. It was my house. Your house? It was not. Not at your house. I was there. I thought it was. But he was saying, "What do you think? Should I marry her?" And we're like, "I will if you don't." Met Tim Curry. Nice. We met him. He, he was doing these cons for a bit. Yeah. Amazing. What a talent. Do you have a starstruck moment, Lisa? Huh? Do you have a moment where you were starstruck? Um. Uh. Well, I saw Barbara Streisand across the room. That was pretty <laughs> starstruck. -y, but I didn't work with her or anything. Yeah. But I did see her, and that was exciting. I mean, usually I'm not all that starstruck, but she really kind of made me kind of weak in the knees. I guess. <laughs> Barbara Streisand. Yeah. Huge. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, you had someone over here? Yes. I, in, in all deference to the wonderful horror community, you were in one of my top five movies of all time. Can you talk a little bit about working on Tombstone? Surely. Um, another incredible cast uh, and one of the best scripts. You know, I had the pleasure to be part of um, You know, it was, uh, it was an incredible... Uh, Incredible film. People really love that movie. It really resonates with so many folks. Um, quotable. Quotable. <laughs> Often quoted. It was funny to turn up, you know, thinking you're doing a western and realizing you're wearing, you know, tights and a god piece. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ride hell for leather. <laughs> wear it. You know. um, and <laughs> Uh, no, it was, it was epic and really, really fun to, to uh, play that particular role uh, and just work with all those lovely people. It was a beautiful movie. It really holds up. Thank you, indeed. Anyone yeah. else? Yes? Yes. Um, the movie that I actually really learned to admire you for it was actually not a movie where you know, I actually loved your character. It was a movie where I hated your character in Titanic. <laughs> Um, but that made me respect you so much because I literally hated you for so many years. <laughs> but, so can you please tell me, sir, how, I mean, because, I mean, how hard was it to play that character, especially the accent, too? And have you ever watched the movie back and 
hated your own character. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, it's, it was an interesting thing, you know, to be universally loathed. <laughs> It's, it was uh, in every language. Um, <laughs> so I like to say, God, you know, that is true, though. You know, it's funny when you land in a different country. Like, You're the Oz. Like, yes. yes. I am the Oz. <laughs> It wasn't the iceberg, I didn't kill 2,000 people. <laughs> a little angry, and my girlfriend slept with another guy. And I said, big stretch. Jeez, come on. Just made room somewhere else. Oh, sorry. Anyway, listen, family show. Um, yeah, love that character. If you watch it again with the concept that I played it like a comedy, you will laugh and enjoy it. <laughs> because it was, he was so, the absurdity of the character, like the, the hubris was something that um, Jim Cameron and I enjoyed to no end. Because, you know, the character is, is such a mirror for the age and, the, and a big kind of theme of the film that led to this tragedy, as, our, as is everyone, but in particular, Cal was crafted to just represent why that thing, you know, was such a tragedy in so many ways. And the, um, the yes, the arrogance, yes, the, you know, the, the, it was just, we found ourselves laughing at, at the fact that he just didn't, you know, of course he was getting off the boat. There was no question he was getting off the boat. The sinking was almost like a nuisance, you know. It's like, where's the chick, you know? What's <laughs> going on? Um, and that was, it was, um, it was wonderful to play because he was so, you know, uh, yes, despicable, somehow relatable, but, you know, it, it, but um, funny to me in a weird way and kind of entertaining. That was just my own. Some twisted humor, I guess. <laughs> Appreciated the gig, but you know, it seemed to pay off. I'm glad you hate me. That's <laughs> no, I like you now. No, it's okay. I was 12 years old when I came. No, no, no. I like you now. <laughs> yes, you. Yes. Not so much a question, but thought I'd point out um, in the Phantom movie, you say nobody turns down the Phantom, but Rose did. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh. Rose was wearing that purple spandex. That's exceeding. <laughs> the water was cold. <laughs> yes, sir. I was just wondering uh, what the fictional or When I was young, I, for, for many years, I wanted to be Zorro. I used to sign my school papers with a Z. <laughs> I thought Zorro was cool. It was like Batman. Tyrone Power is Zorro was cool. Lisa, uh, is there a fictional character that you want to be? Oh, I like, you know, I like classics. I wanted to be Juliet very badly. I wanted to be Camille. <laughs> I wanted to be um, a bunch of no, I wanted to be Kate and Tim Fisher. I wanted to like Shakespeare roles, basically, but I hear I went to Hollywood instead of staying here. <laughs> Can you hear her? Yeah. A little. You're in the front row and it's mezzo mezzo. All right. Just saying. <laughs> Thank you. Um, anyway, yeah, so the, the, the sort of, I wanted to play the, the classics. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Some great, uh, there's some great theater roles. Some Tennessee Williams roles, you know? <coughs> Trier. Stanley Walsh. No, not Stanley. You, know, <laughs> you guys both came from the theater, correct? In the beginning? Well, sort of. Yeah. yeah. For, did, short, I'm not sure. for a short while. Started out, yeah, a couple, yeah. And if you, I know you went back in Chicago. I saw you went in Chicago um, when you were doing the Sound of Music. I told you I ran into you coming up the turnstile. <laughs> I was running up home. <laughs> Um, have you done any theater since? 
or since when? Well, you know what? Um, Sorry, doing films. I started. Yeah, my first few roles as an actress were theater roles for sure. I was in the Cherry Orchard, and I was in this restoration comedy, you know, in Chicago, and um, some other stuff. And then, um, yeah, and I, I originated the role. Of, I don't know if I can talk Prelude to a Kiss. Meg Ryan, so I originated that role on stage. Ooh. Those kinds of things, you know, for a while early on. Yeah. Have but you done anything since? On stage, I created a, a show. Well, I'm not to talk about it. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it was um, uh, a one woman show. Right here. <laughs> it was a one woman show about the history of saloon singing, because I'm also a singer. And I was offered a, a, a stage to do something, and I was trying to think of what to do. Uh, you know, do something you know surrounding my singing, basically. So I thought, well, why not the history of saloon singing? Because I do sing in saloons, basically. I'm, I'm a, I'm a like a cabaret singer. Or something. So, um, so it started at the turn of the century, and it went to the you know turn of the next century, and uh, it went kind of all over the world. And it was just these vignettes of singers who sing in bars. It was France, it was Italy, it was Spain. It was and it, it was a really cool show, actually. Yeah. And so that was the last theatrical production I was part of. And I, yeah, I was really proud of that. That's terrific. Yeah, yeah, that's terrific. <laughs> cool. Anyone have a video? <laughs> what? Anyone have a video of that performance? Then I would love to see it. <laughs> well, you know what I wanted to do is to keep it going and just, you know, create vignette after vignette after vignette and just keep it rolling in some way. You know, I thought it would be a good kind of um, perennial. But anyways, maybe maybe I'll revive it someday. And you're still recording music, yes? Oh yeah, I'm about to turn out of my third record. Oh, I'm so excited. Yeah. I know, I'm very excited. It's classical Spanish music. Oh. It's gonna be really nice. With lyrics. <laughs> to them, to these classical songs. <laughs> well, yeah, of course. I mean, I have to sing something. <laughs> <laughs> or she's gonna hum along the entire time. No, oh, it's really cool. <laughs> yeah. She's the talent in the family, you gotta understand. <laughs> You'd be, be better promoter, but you know, honestly, I'm not so no, she and uh, uh, her partner, he is a classical guitarist uh, from Peru, he's brilliant. And uh, Lisa wrote all these original lyrics a to few, classical. A few, a few, yeah. A few. No, no, more no. Than some of the ones. Anyway. Anyway, look for it. It's called Eccentric Classics. It'll be coming out. And, and one more for Lisa, sorry. No. Um, Sorry, Billy. Um, <laughs> you wrote the original ending song from Freddie's Dead, correct? But they no, did I, 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 um, I submitted one. Yeah, but they I didn't wrote, use it. But they didn't use it because I wrote something that sounded like a James Bond theme, yeah. which is kind of my wheelhouse a little in terms of singing, at least it was at the time. And so it was called The Worst Is Over, and it was kind of very tongue-in-cheek. And um, they liked it alright, but they went with Iggy Pop, which I don't blame them. It was much more to the. Well, with that video montage for the credits, it worked. Yeah, it worked really good. But I really love Paris. It was a beautiful. Did album. you hear it? Did you find? Did you find? I it? did. Well, um, he asked where I found it, and what happened was I bought one of your CDs. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I think from you in Chicago, it flashed back with me, and I liked it. Thanks. And then I wanted more. So I was looking up what else, what, what other CDs you got out there, and then that popped up on YouTube, the song. It did, great. It did. Somebody posted it, how the, who knows how they found it, but I'm glad they did. Yeah, yeah. and then I downloaded it to my iPod. Awesome. So now it's on my playlist. I love it. <laughs> Do you know the little ditty I sing in Charmed, at uh, the end of my art? Lisa wrote that too. You did too? Yeah. See? Yeah, so anyways, the music is great. Lisa Zane is at com. Mm -hmm. You can find all those CDs, right? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, I know I had more questions. Yes, yes. Uh, for both of you, what's the most mentally or physically taxing role you've ever played on screen or stage? Ooh, good one. Mm. Mentally, physically taxing. Or physically. Either or. On stage, uh, I did a two-hander with the lovely Claire Bloom in London oh. at the uh, uh, Royal Haymarket Theater. It was a beautiful, classic theater in the city. The theaters was, uh, are all... Yeah, that's, you know, John Gilgood spent the Blitzkrieg like in the dressing room of 
I was using it. It was truly crazy historic. Anyway, um, it was a two-hander, which means there's only two of us in it, and uh, I played a dance teacher who was teaching uh, ballroom dancing to an elderly woman in Miami, and it was called Six Dance Lessons in Six Weeks, a charming play, really, really amazing. But I uh, had to train with the, uh, um, in England it's uh, strictly from dancing or strictly ballroom, strictly coaches to learn all these dances and then perform them or teach them to that point. But it was, a, it was you know, the rehearsal period was pretty short and it was kind of grueling and a lot of fun, to say the least. Are you um, telling me you couldn't pull in your premiere performance in Demon Knight? I could have what? Your tango in Demon Knight? You didn't want to use that? <laughs> there was that. Maybe it would have been Johnny Castle. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, movie-wise, oh, but it was good, you know. It was like the Phantom, you lost a pound of flesh every day on that thing. There was, you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of cuts and bruises and blood. There was no, you know, I, there was no protection in that suit, which is why it looked so good. Be <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, modest. They had, to, they, had to, they had to prepare. They had to a lot of sewing and a lot of re like, oh, you know, washing the blood. So, yeah, that was a good one. Good pain. Well worth. It. You know, I'm, I'm racking my brains to think of what was exhausting. And I can't. I do remember that I did do this play in Chicago. It was a, it was, um, it was, called, it was by Afra Bend, uh, who was a rare kind of female playwright in the Restoration era. And it was called, um, damn, I can't remember what it was called. All I know is that I literally had to eat a steak before every performance because it was exhausting. It was physically exhausting, and I just. And there's some roles where you just, you know, just want to eat nothing, you know, and float through like a ghost. And then some roles you really need your protein, and that was one of them. And I do remember that. I had, it was Chicago, so I'd go to like Miller's Pub and have a big steak, like every Next night. Checker. And then just because there were crazy costume changes and you're running and running, and it was just like kind of a farce, you know. So you know was that at the Goodman. You've done a lot. Oh. <laughs> oh, never. Never. Um, really, I want to talk to you about um, Lucid. Great films. Yeah. How did that come about? It, has anyone seen Lucid? No? Well, please no. check it out. It's streaming on Tubi. You can watch it right now. <laughs> How did that come about? Uh, it's about lucid dreaming. Oh, and wow. it's really interesting. It's kind of of a thriller, it seems structurally, but really it's about the anatomy of a kiss, of the first kiss, of a kind of you know kid who's on the spectrum. And anxiety wow. too. And uh, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a dream therapist who's his neighbor who notices he's having some issues and offer my assistance as a counselor. I spend most of the film as he spends most of his life in you know pajamas like. Definitely. Perfect for COVID times. He sleeps guys. a lot, but, you know. He has to sleep. He's he's doing lucid dreaming, but he, uh, but it's a really, it's kind of a a very cool character. I really love playing him. He had the kind of uh, you know charming, affable nature of a Bill Murray like you know wacky uncle, um, but who offered really sound uh, advice and safe space for this kid to kind of you know explore and come out of his shell a little bit while well, in his dream state he's exploring and confronting a lot of these barriers. But it's beautifully shot and really well acted and great cast. That was Australian, was it? It was English. It was English. a fit in the yeah. yeah, it was a beautiful film. I curiously, the, the director was legally blind. Wow. Yeah, I heard that. It's a true story. And uh, it's it's a brilliant film. It's won, it won quite a bit of awards. Um, and the irony that, you know, this guy was definitely just, just, just like almost completely blind. Because he shapes, maybe. Shapes, maybe, but yeah. he trusted, you know, it came later in life. Um, um, Adam Morris, you can read about him. There's quite a few interesting articles if you look up Lucid and Adam Morris. Um, very talented fellow. 
um, who is just has taken upon this challenge. He's acting now. He does quite a bit. He's got an acting career. He's really embraced or used this seeming deficit as an asset to kind of you know challenge himself and build upon. He had built a uh, or shaped a, a sensibility, an aesthetic sensibility early in life, and then hired people who he trusted to execute. Um, but he didn't tell us. I didn't know this until the fourth day of filming. Because they were afraid I wouldn't do the movie if I knew the director was blind. <laughs> so I showed up in England. I was wondering where he's like two inches from the biggest monitor on set I've ever seen. I'm like, hey, IMAX, what's going on? Uh, <laughs> wow. And he's like, I'm, uh, I'm legally blind. I'm like, Fantastic. <laughs> you need another one? He's like, no, 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 we're good. Okay, great, bring it on. So that's genius. Um, so he listens to the tape and he stands up close. He's like, you know, very discerning. The movie's beautiful. But uh, fascinating kid. Very talented man. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, more questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Just a question, Bill, not trying to get into personal, but, but what, what's the one thing that you proud of at this point in your life? Uh, you know, I know it's a pat answer, but it's true. You know, my kids, uh, to be honest, I, they're pretty awesome. Little girls grow no, every day. No, I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> you know that, that I want to know. That takes the cake. Um, uh, I attribute any success I've had to service, you know? It was a organizing principle I kind of stumbled into early on by, you know, certainly at the hand of stewardship of really great parents, you know, and some other surrogates who imparted with really great pearls of wisdom along the way. My sister was a great influence, you know. And uh, when I apply a lot of those great life lessons and remember to and balance it <laughs> check the ego a little and really kind of let those things just uh, spread the wealth with new artists and then see how they come around like there's people who are coming back to me now who remind me that I met them when they were young and I was practicing this early and I was early in my career and I clearly met them early on and 20 years later 15 years later they have done some amazing things and have reached out and said I took your advice and I applied it done this, that makes me really proud of that. It's like, it's kind of like a teacher gene. I don't know, there's something about it. We have some educators in our family and it was just, I didn't realize it, but I think it's in the DNA. That just turns me on. Share, just imparting with, you know, some sound knowledge that they, you know, others have had. Um, I recommend it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lisa, do you have an answer for that one? I'm proud to still be alive. I, I took some risks, and I'm just glad I'm still alive. <laughs> I shouldn't be here right now. <laughs> I think that kind of all proud, of us. I'm proud like, to survive. Life's hard. I mean, life's rocky. It's touchy. It's not kind of weak. It's found money. Okay, <laughs> but we are all still here right now today, right? And that's good. The 80s were great. <laughs> Okay, um, Anyone, any others? The Titanic question kind of brought back a memory. I thought I remembered an interview with, with you right when it released where you seemed like you were kind of taken aback by how people would treat you in public. Were there any more notable exchanges that stuck out um, in the time after Titanic that kind of felt a little like, whoa. Um, briefly, I mean, of course, it's always, you know, interesting and su surprising the, the impact of something that this magnitude had had. Sure. But just afterwards, I had filmed in, in Morocco, and I was doing a, a miniseries about Cleopatra uh, for the Hallmark Channel, for ABC or something. It's kind of a fun two-part. Check it out if you haven't. I played Mark Anthony. It was a great treat to do. But took a break from it and went deep into the Sahara on a bit of an adventure with a couple of guides, rode camel and then camel, jeep to camel and camel to tent, and did an overnight. And when we got to this Bedouin tent, they lifted, they're making some tea and 
it's under the crazy stars. And the dude looked up, pulled back his jalaba, looking like Obi-Wan, looked at me and he went, great movie. And I, went, <laughs> and I realized that the sphere of influence at that point was really dynamic. You know? I was like, damn, this, this movie's big. I didn't see any, like, there's no electricity out there. there was, I don't know what they were watching. This, and this was, this was early, you know, these were early days. It was probably like a Russian bootleg that came out before the movie, for all I know. But damn, it was. Uh, yeah, that was a, that was a, that was a memorable exchange. On that note, folks, I think we got to love you and leave you. Get back to the tables. We'll see you over there. What a pleasure! And thank you for your questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Big round of applause for me. Yeah.